This week's episode was brought to you by Queenie Jackal and Connor McMenemy. If you too would like to support the show, please visit www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit and consider becoming a subscriber where you get all the extended shows, stickers, bonus art, diagrams, and discord access where you may interact with myself and our assortment of wizards, witches, and warlocks waiting to teach you how to pickle gnomes feet and clean your cauldron with only non-toxic organic materials that you can find at any transnuptial dimension. This week we're discussing another Luciferian classic, Robert Anton Wilson's Prometheus Rising. Fair warning, the extended show where I discuss the Third Circuit is none too long, an extra 15 minutes or so. So with that in mind, thank you and enjoy the show. And if you too want to learn how to nerd out girls with really weird esoteric information, to distract them before they curse the moon again you also can get on our discord but that's not what we're talking about today hello everybody and welcome to the whole rabbit where we don't just spend one week ruminating on the esoteric tenets of promethean liberalism no we go in hard for round two pulling passages from old bob's bad bad bible and if last week we were exploring Lucifer's manifesto, then this week it can be said we're looking at his diagnostic handbook for the human psyche. Well, Jack's work is succinct, Bob is rather lame. So strap yourself in, boot up those futuristic pocket bombs, and prepare for Prometheus Rising. It's hard to talk about Prometheus Rising without talking a little bit about its author, Robert Anton Wilson who was born January 18th, 1932, in Brooklyn, New York, settling down in the middle-class neighborhood of Bay Ridge by the time he was 13. Childhood for Bob was not always pleasant, though. As a young child, he would contract polio, and it was treated using the novel Kenny Method, a prototypical form of physical therapy which achieved mostly successful results. Regardless of the program's success, Bob would never fully recover and suffered post-polio syndrome, resulting in uncontrollable muscle spasms and pain, which required him the use of a cane until his death in 2007. Tragically, his daughter Luna was known for being the first subject to have her brain cryogenically preserved by the Bay Area Cryogenic Society after being savagely beaten to death at the age of 15 during a supposed robbery of the store where she worked. I mention these two parts of Robert's life because without knowing them, one might feel tempted to suspicion regarding his gregarious and optimistic nature, thinking them born of naivety. On the contrary, it speaks to the veracity and efficacy of his exciting and fun philosophical portfolio. Why do I mention fun? It's probably the most important part of Robert Anton Wilson. Anyone who's a serious devotee of conspiracy theory, conspiracy theories, has certainly seen the Illuminati card trading game. Comparing current events to the images on the set of cards is an undeniably fun pastime of X and even poll on 4chan, appearing as often humorous and sometimes terrifying a priori evidence of a nefarious zeitgeist unfolding. It was Robert Anton Wilson's Illuminatus trilogy that the cards are based on. It should be worthy of some note that the publisher of said cards, Steve Jackson Games, also produced the GURP system of role-playing, similar to D&D, which can be seen represented in the video game world as the Fallout series. Likewise, the Illuminatus trilogy itself was written with the expressed intention of advancing the Discordian religion. According to Bob, we felt the Discordian society needed some opposition because the whole idea of it was based on conflict and dialectics. So we created an opposition within the Discordian society, which we called the Bavarian Illuminati. So we built up this myth about the warfare between the Discordian society and the Illuminati for quite a while until one day Bob Shea said to me, you know, we could write a novel about this. An endeavor he only took seriously after surrendering his beloved authorship position at Ploy magazine, which, according to him, paid him a higher salary than any other magazine which he had worked and didn't expect him to be a conformist or sell his soul in return. He enjoyed many years in the bunny empire. Quote, I only resigned when I reached 40 and I felt I could not live with myself. Did I only make an effort to write full time at last? 
Arguably, Prometheus Rising is his magnum opus, having first produced it as a dissertation for a soon-to-be-defunct university from which he would receive his PhD in psychology. So, he introduces the text as thus. Like most of my books, this text emerged only partly from my conscious design and partly from suspicious accidents. It actually began as a PhD dissertation called The Evolution of Neurosociological Circuits, a Contribution to the Sociobiology of Consciousness, which I wrote in 1978 to 79 for an alternative university called Paideia. At that time, Paideia ranked as state approved, the highest rating given to alternative universities in California, where we had alternatives to everything. And the state feels required to classify the alternatives on a scale from experimental to totally bonkers. In Ireland, 1982, stuck with a dissertation which I liked quite a lot and a PhD diploma which, due to the collapse of Paideia, looked less impressive, I decided to rewrite the manuscript in a more commercial form. First, he removed the footnotes, and then he took out all the, quote, academic stink, which would annoy the average reader. Then he said he expressed himself a little more bluntly and in many places added humor and removed any sort of good taste that he had put in. Uh, also, he wrote a few more chapters, created a whole bunch of little esoteric exercises, sketched out diagrams and illustrations, and then removed all the references to Timothy Leary, because at the time, pretty much anything about Leary was just being thrown out. And if you talked about him, you'd be blacklisted and had your ideas thrown in the junk heap. So he saved those ideas for like a little bit later. So the structure of Prometheus Rising largely adheres, though, to Timothy Leary's Eighth Circuit model of consciousness and it serves as the blueprint for exploring the human consciousness one ladder step at a time working towards higher and higher levels of complexity and spiritual power and frankly when i was in college taking upper division psychology courses i found myself being dissatisfied because i never once read or was assigned anything that took the human psyche and put it all together in a way that made sense as a whole, the way you would expect an astronomy textbook to be. You have all these different studies of the sky and stars and constellations, and we've had a, a lifetime of different ideas about what's up there, but you could still put it all in a book and be like, this is more or less what it is. And I found it very frustrating that I lived in a world where advertisers and politicians and economists had more or less figured out the practical side of human behavior. But when I went to study it in class, lo and behold, it was just a bunch of different weird theories that hadn't ever been put together in any sort of coherent framework where Prometheus Rising had put it together in a coherent framework. And even in some places where it seems a bit old or quaint or even hippy dippy, it's easy to look beyond those things because it brings up relevant questions of spirituality, religion, economics, and it makes an attempt to answer some of the harder questions and hang ups that we have in our society today that we're still dealing with now, not unlike how Jack Parsons did in Freedom is a Two Edged Sword, but it deals with things psychologically. So let's jump into it. The Thinker and the Prover. Prometheus Rising initiates its narrative by drawing the reader's attention to a pretty basic but unavoidable facet of the human mind. Nonetheless, the simple principle is profoundly powerful, and experimenting with its application would later become one of the few unifying precepts of chaos magic. Whatever the Thinker thinks, the Prover proves. I quote, as psychiatrists and psychologists have often observed, much to the chagrin of their medical colleagues, the thinker can think itself sick and even think itself well again. The prover is a much simpler mechanism. It operates on one law only. Whatever the thinker thinks, the prover proves. To cite a notorious example, which unleashed incredible horrors early in this century, if the thinker thinks... That all Jews are rich, the prover will prove it. It will find evidence that the poorest Jew in the most run-down ghetto has hidden money somewhere. Similarly, feminists are able to believe that all men, including the starving wretches who live and sleep on the streets, are exploiting all women, including the Queen of England. 
One need only visit Twitter or 4chan to see these exact examples happen in real time. In fact, I would say our entire political discourse has been reduced to this principle, which we now call the echo chamber, where people just based on what they already believe, keep proving it to themselves and the people who already believe it over and over and over again, and then wonder why the people that think differently think differently. Curious how that works, but it does work. And that's why at the time of this recording, both parties that are competing for political control in the United States are very frustrated that regardless of their actions or the actions of their political enemy, the poll numbers don't really seem to be moving. Whatever the thinker thinks, the prover proves. Have you ever had a friend that thought they were being followed or watched by the government or tailed by a gang or all three? It's very difficult to talk that person out of it. Every car that goes by, every little noise that comes from the next door neighbor's yard seems to prove and be evidence of the fact that they are being watched. This seems to operate on that principle when it's gone into overdrive mode. But nonetheless, it appears to operate in the background of the human psyche pretty much constantly. It's kind of like if someone believes they can't do something, they probably won't be able to. If you aim for failure, you'll hit it. If you think you can, maybe you can. I guess that sounds a bit like new thinking, but there's some truth to it. People do think themselves sick and do think themselves well again. And if you're a crazy person like me, I also think that UFOs work on this principle. Whatever you think you're looking at, that's how they present themselves to you. Just my hot take. I've listened to enough podcasts, having never been abducted myself, um, to know and to speak on it as an authority that if you lived in the 80s, it seems like when the UFOs came to you, they had high tech stuff from the perspective of somebody in the 80s. And they probably just appeared as fairies to people who believed in fairies. And if I'm completely wrong about that, I tend to think occultism works this way as well to some degree, where if you believe that God is a certain way, your experience of God tends to be more or less along those lines. That's another reason it's a bit imprudent to ignore your ancestral heritage in terms of spirituality and belief. For instance, if you suddenly want to just jump into worshiping demons and you come from a family of Catholics, well, it's likely that your experience of demons might be negative the first time or the second time, or it might take you a while to move beyond your ingrained beliefs about something because they inherently limit you. But we'll get more to that later. Hardware and software, the brain and its programs. In this chapter, it's made clear that while the brain is not a computer, it might be modeled as one. Our bodies may be modeled as hardware and our thoughts, ideas and culture may be considered software. Quote, the hardware is more real than the software in that you can always locate it in space time. If it's not in the bedroom, somebody must have moved it to the study, etc. On the other hand, The software is more real in the sense that you can smash the hardware back to dust, kill the computer, and the software still exists and can materialize or manifest again in a a different computer. Any speculations about reincarnation at this point are the responsibility of the reader, not the author. Because the human brain, like other animals, acts as an electrocolloidal computer, not a solid state computer, It follows the same laws as other animal brains. That is, the programs get into the brain as electrochemical bonds in discrete quantum stages. This is like that part in V for Vendetta when he's like, you can kill me, but ideas never die. And he like stabs everyone with a dagger. Not to ruin V for Vendetta, but that's totally what happens. But it's a romantic and true notion that even though you can smash the individual, the idea and spirit of liberty that lives in that individual will live on and reassert itself again or something. Right. But Robert Anton Wilson is giving it a scientific basis that information exists in electrochemical bonds and those things 
are built into our DNA and make up our culture. He says here, each set of programs consists of four basic parts. One, genetic imperatives, totally hardwired programs or instincts. Two, imprints. These are more or less hardwired programs, which the brain is genetically designed to accept only at certain points in its development. These points are known in ethology as times of imprint vulnerability. Now that's important. We'll get to that. What imprints are. Three, conditioning. These are programs built onto the imprints. They are looser and fairly easy to change with counter conditioning. Four is learning. This is even looser and softer than conditioning. So we can see a stair step case moving from hard built genetic materials all the way to the etheric world of words and ideas and the hinterlands between them. In general, the primordial imprint can always overrule any subsequent conditioning or learning. An imprint is a species of software that has become built-in hardware, being impressed on the tender neurons when they are particularly open and vulnerable. Imprints, software frozen into hardware, are the non-negotiable aspects of our individuality. Out of the infinity of possible programs existing as potential software, the imprint establishes the limits, parameters, within which all subsequent conditions and learning occurs. So I'm not a programmer, but it sounds like there's a priority tree going on where once the most primordial program starts to run, it overrides the newer, softer programmed ones. OK, next. Before the first imprint, the consciousness of the infant is formless and void, like the universe at the beginning of Genesis, or the descriptions of unconditioned, quote, enlightened consciousness in the mystic traditions. As soon as the first imprint is made, structure emerges out of the creative void. The growing mind, alas, becomes trapped within this structure. It identifies with the structure, in a sense, it becomes the structure. Each successive imprint complicates the software which programs our experience and which we experience as reality. Conditioning and learning build further networks onto this bedrock of imprinted software. The total structure of this brain circuitry makes up our map of the world. It is what our thinker thinks, and our prover mechanically fits all incoming signals to the limitations of this map. Now this is where Timothy Leary's eight circuit model comes into play. Because within Prometheus Rising, it is explored the idea that the human psyche is built up in a certain way and advances in levels of complexity, complicating the map. An overview of the eight circuits goes as thus. One, the oral biosurvival circuit. This is imprinted by the mother or the first mothering object and conditioned by subsequent nourishment or threat. It is primarily concerned with sucking, feeding, cuddling, and body security. It retreats mechanically from the noxious or predatory or from anything associated by imprinting or conditioning with the noxious or predatory. Two, the anal emotional territorial circuit. This is imprinted in the toddling stage when the infant rises up, walks about, and begins to struggle for power within the family structure. The mostly mammalian circuit processes territorial rules, emotional games or cons, pecking order, and rituals of domination or submission. Three, the time-binding semantic circuit. This is imprinted and conditioned by human artifacts and symbol systems. It handles and packages the environment, classifying everything according to the local reality tunnel, invention, calculation, prediction, and transmitting signals across generations are its functions. Four, the moral socio-sexual circuit. This is imprinted by the first orgasm mating experiences at puberty and is conditioned by tribal taboos. It processes sexual pleasure, local definitions of right and wrong, reproduction, adult parental personality, sex role, and the nurturing of the young. 
the development of these circuits as the brain evolved through evolution, as each domesticated primate human brain recapitulates evolution in growing from infancy to adulthood, makes possible gene pool survival, mammalian sociobiology, pecking order of politics, and transmission of culture. The second group of four brain circuits is much newer, and each circuit exists at present only in minorities, where the antique circuits recapitulate evolution to the present. These futuristic circuits recapitulate our future evolution. So in short, it sounds like what he's saying, the older circuits are antique and left over from getting to the present, and the future circuits have yet to fully activate, but will help us build our ideal future by harmonizing the older antique ones with the newer ones, I think. I mean, it sounds like some pretty hippy dippy trippy 70s stuff but um hey it's hard to beat if i had a jazz flute i would play it right now but i don't and before we get to the bio survival circuit this episode was brought to you by pocket bong are you tired of smelling like bong water are you bad at using lighters does hitting a real bong make you cough well now there's pocket bong all you have to do is download the latest app and the pocket bong appears in your phone. Hold it up to your mouth and inhale the vaporous marijuana weeds directly into your lungs. And then you forget what's happening. Pocket bong. All right, moving on now to the bio survival circuit. The bio survival circuit was created by the Demiurge long, long time ago. In fact, everything has a bio-survival circuit. We've had it for a very long time and functions on a dialectic of go toward or go back, usually in relationship to nourishment and danger, respectively. Without this basic on-off switch in our nervous system's survival would be impossible, acting the most rapidly and mechanical of all of them. So this is the circuit that could just straight up override all the other ones and when you feel it it's all over your body all at once and if you have a problem with it it feels the same way robert anton wilson says observe the speed of your dog's reaction at the first sound of an intruder the threatening bark and the movement of the whole body to alert status is automatic then the dog starts to take other cues to determine how this particular intruder should be treated. This is where you, sharply turning a corner, find yourself face to face with another creature and in under a fifth of a second have sized up more or less if it's a friend, foe or food. Your immediate reaction will likely have a big impact on what happens next. This also seems to be the amount of time it takes for a woman to decide if she's going to sleep with you or not. This is my own personal opinion and suspicion based purely on observation. On this note, it is worth mentioning that the first object linked to oral biosurvival for the mammal is the titty, also known as the nipple, the jugs, the knockers, the boobs, the bazoomas, bazookas, bazongas, boozies, boobage, baps, bus, bristles, breasticles, and sweater puppies. So central is the body part to mammals that they are known medically as the mammaries. Robert suggested our innate tendency to seek our oral survival comfort from a mothering organism is reflected in otherwise irrational magnetism towards cigarettes, Gnawing fingernails, chewing gum, nibbling mustaches, chewing pencils, smoking vape, and even enjoying beer and tater chips. This episode has been brought to you by Titty Chips. If you want some titty chips, cry for them. He explains that the bio survival circuit attaches to the first safe space around the object of comfort, the mother, and then moves outward further and further, exploring what is safe and what is not. Depending on how one is imprinted during this vulnerable learning stage, one may acquire bravery, inquisitiveness, and while others, they may acquire infophobia and withdrawal. Once the imprint is made, these programs then run automatically, instantaneously, on autopilot in zero time. I just found myself doing it, says the soldier as he is being court-martialed for cowardice or decorated for bravery. 
Upon the hardwired imprinting of the bio survival circuit comes the softer ones, where the organism generalizes the safe space outward from the mother's body to include the pack or tribe, the extended family. What up, Columbia? What up, Babylon? He explains that this is why the dog barks for you as the pack leader, the way it may bark for other dogs in a wild dog pack. This is part of our Darwinian instinct of self-preservation. It extends to the rest of the pack or gene pool and is the basis of altruism or the will to do good for others in your tribe or pack. It's argued in this chapter that these bonds of biosecurity have been replaced by tickets of biosurvival that we call money. Money assures our bio survival and is speculated to be at the root of our existential disconnect and sense of alienation. The phrase, all we need is love, is a sardonic joke in a world where we necessarily require money to live. Bob asks us to imagine what it would feel like if all our money were suddenly removed from us. He suggests that it is identical to how an ancient person or animal might feel being ostracized, banished, or cut off from the pack. In traditions past, being a part of a tribe meant biosecurity. Now that's assured by money. It can be demonstrated that suicide and interest rates correlate and why certain ideologies are somewhat justified in their suspicion of our financial system. But the rampant biosurvival anxiety would only be quenched when the worldwide wealth reached a level of distribution where everyone had enough tickets without a boot on their neck. This is where Bob unleashes some politically questionable yet strangely compelling theories about imprinting and its effects on our visible body. This might offend some people. It sounds kind of dumb in some cases, but in other cases, it seems, like I said, intuitive. So hold on to your seatbelts, peoples. Um, Extreme cases, and I'm quoting, persons who take their heaviest imprint on the first oral circuit tend to be viscerotonic because this imprint determines lifelong endocrine and glandular processes. Thus, in extreme, they are baby-faced in adult life, never lose their, quote, baby fat, are plump and round and gentle. They're easily hurt, threatened, terrified by disapproval of any sort because in the baby circuit of the brain, Disapproval suggests extinction by loss of the food supply. We all have this circuit and need to exercise it periodically. Cuddling, sucking, hugging, and daily playing A, one's own body, or B, another person's body, or C, the environment, are perpetually necessary to neurosomatic endocrine health. These who deny such primordial functions because of rigid imprinting on the third rationalistic or fourth moralistic circuit tend to become dried up, prune-faced, unattractive, cold, and muscularly rigid. The baby functions of playing with one's own body, another's body, and the environment continue throughout life in all animals. This playfulness is a marked characteristic of all conspicuously healthy individuals of the sort Maswell calls self-actualizers. If this initial imprint is negative, if the universe in general and other humans in particular are imprinted as dangerous, hostile, and frightening, the prover will go on throughout life adjusting all perceptions to fit this map. This is what is known as the injustice collector syndrome in the language of Dr. Edmund Burglar. And I would love to list off some of these people that collect injustices or are injustice collectors in this episode, but I'd rather not call my call the wrath of them upon me because I, too, like having bio survival tickets. Bob then says the extreme members of both left and right are composed of people that have taken the hardest and most negative imprinting on this level. I think there's something to be said for this. As Gregory Bateson has pointed out, 
Conrad Lorenz acquired his marvelous insights into the imprinting process for which he won the Nobel Prize by consciously imitating the body movements of the animals he was studying. Watching Lorenz's lecture, one could see each animal he discussed because Lorenz would dramatize or become that animal, the man of a method actor. Even earlier, Wilhelm Reich discovered that he could understand his patients with remarkable clarity by imitating their characteristic body movements and postures. The bio survival imprints, especially traumatic ones, are all over the body, frozen in Reich's metaphor, in chronic muscular and gland mechanisms. If you can't understand somebody's irrational behavior, start by observing their breathing. You will very quickly get an idea of what's bothering them. This is why all schools of yoga, Buddhist, Hindu, or Sufi, place such emphasis on restoring natural breathing before trying to move the student on to higher circuits and wider consciousness. So even if you're a crazy, super elite chaos magician of the most uncategorizable sort, you might find yourself looking through Peter Carroll's Lieber Null Psychonaut and finding that the first exercises, no matter which path you devote yourself, necessarily involve some form of breath control because the breath is linked to the mind. And in Kabbalah, the Ruach, the mind, and air, they're all the same concept. So it's easy to see why controlling the breath might also control the mind. And if you can control your mind, then you can control the force, and the force shall set you free. I heard that somewhere. It's probably somewhere really esoteric and occulty. And I think one of the exercises in this chapter, because there's exercises in every chapter, if you want to explore the stuff in Prometheus Rising, and this is why you need the text, you get assigned little homework assignments. And one of them here is to method act after animals. So get out there and be a crow. Ah! And crows are bona fide the best animal, besides rabbits, of course. Gah! They look out for each other, you know? They're good good role model and they like the shiny can you imagine if the crow was our national bird that'd be so dope nothing is wrong with the eagle except benjamin franklin said it was an ignoble bird and that we'd be better off having a rattlesnake but had he considered the crow you know the difference between a crow and a raven well a raven can carry four opinion nuts and a crow can carry three so it's really just a matter of opinion <laughs> oh geez moving on now um throughout human life when the bio survival circuit senses danger all other mental activity ceases all other circuits shut down until the bio survival problem is solved realistically or symbolically this is the crucial importance of mind washing and brain programming to create a new imprint, first reduce the subject to a state of infancy. For example, biosurvival vulnerability. We will enlarge upon this later. In pre-neurological terms, the biosurvival circuit is what we usually call consciousness, per se. It is the sense of being here now, in this vulnerable body, subject to the raw energies and forces of the physical universe. When we are unconscious... The biosurvival circuit is turned off, and doctors may cut us up without our attempting to flee or even cry out. It's kind of dramatic, Bob. Give me some of that, though, for real. Pain. It's the better of us all. Metal Gear. But this is the reason why it's important when you're kidnapping somebody to put a black bag over their head or to put them in the trunk of the car because you want it to be dark and isolating and the car recapitulates the womb and it infantilizes your subject. So when they reemerge out of the trunk, they're like your baby. They're like your little person now that you have to take care of and they necessarily have to rely on you for their emotional security. That's how you turn. That's how you become somebody's mommy or daddy. In a hostage situation or a cult 
or a secret order. If you're going to join a cult, usually they do some sort of thing that reduces you to uh, infantilism or the like they put maybe put you in a coffin or cover your face with something. And they're like, we could totally kill you right now. And nobody would even care. We know because we asked all your friends and family and they don't give a shit. So I just made that part up. I'm sure everyone cares about you. And if they don't, I care about you. I care about you more than your family, which you should never, ever, ever, ever talk to on any condition, especially Christmas, because Christmas is the devil. But we'll tell you more about that in our holy texts, which you can buy at our bookstore for $9.99 a page. And you have to arrange them yourself based on the secret principles of the cult which by the way you can join at www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit where five dollars will gain you entry into a, a life-changing organization that will make all the decisions you've ever wanted to have made for you made for you by highly qualified bureaucrats that know nothing about your life but everything about the esoteric principles which govern it and qualify them to govern over it with the wicked laser-like precision of Lao Tzu on cocaine the quality of which is ranked for presidential boofing and that brings us to the second circuit Dun, 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 the anal emotional territorial circuit. This is where we take a turn from boobies to butt stuff. The second circuit is the power politics circuit. Bob says it's the patriotic circuit and is built into all vertebrates and is perhaps 500 million to 1000 million years old. In the modern human, it seems to be centralized in the thalamus the back of the brain or old brain and is linked with the voluntary nervous system and muscles. This circuit appears in each newborn when the DNA master tape sends out RNA messenger molecules to trigger the mutation from neonate to toddler, which involves, first of all, standing erect, walking, mastering gravity, overcoming physical obstacles and learning to manipulate others politically are the vulnerable points at which imprinting and heavy conditioning occur. The muscles that perform these power functions are quickly programmed to become chronic, lifelong reflexes. Depending, as always, on the accidents of the environment, what happens at points of neurological vulnerability, this circuit will organize itself into a strong, dominating role in the pack or family, or a weak, submissive role. Without going into the jungles with the etiologists, one can observe this mammalian imprinting process in any litter of puppies. It's very quickly determined who is top dog and who is bottom dog. Likewise, this dialectic involves a lot of shit because marking territories with excretions is a thing and throwing shit at enemies during territory disputes is something that apes do as well. I'm quickly reminded of George Carlin's correlative summary of war. What? They have bigger dicks? Bomb them. And of course, the bullets and bombs and missiles all look like dicks. <laughs> Getting a boot in the ass, the shit kicked out of you, and taking the piss out of somebody all speak quite clearly to the function of this circuit. The standard authority reflex on the emotional territorial circuit is to swell the muscles and howl. You will find this amongst birds as well as mammals and boardroom meetings at your local bank. The standard submission reflex is to shrink the muscles, lower the head and crawl away. You will find this amongst dogs, primates, fowl and employees who wish to keep their jobs everywhere. If the first bio survival circuit is chiefly imprinted by the mother, the second emotional territorial circuit is chiefly imprinted by the father, the nearest alpha male. It has been proposed by sociologist G. Rattray Taylor that societies swing back and forth between matris periods in which motherly oral values predominate and patris periods in which fatherly anal values are in ascendance. Woo! <laughs> Who wants some fatherly anal values in ascendance? <laughs> <laughs> like half of you listening to the show, probably. I know, because you're weird, but I am weirder. So, so please 
hold on to your pocket bongs because we're about to take a look at this diagram between the matrist and the patrist. This is based on the research of Rattray Taylor, as mentioned in the previous paragraph. Now, let's go down the list, okay? This is pretty interesting. You've got matrix on one side, patrix on the other side. And and then I'm going to read them like left to right. So matrix and then to patrix. Permissive towards sex, restrictive towards sex. Freedom for women, limitation of freedom for women. Women have high status. Women have low status. Chastity is not valued. Chastity is highly valued. Egalitarian, authoritarian. Progressive, conservative. No distrust of research. Distrust of research. Spontaneous. Inhibitions. Sex differences minimized. Sex differences maximized. Fear of incest. Fear of homosexuality. Hedonic. Ascetic. Mother goddess. Father god. Whether or not societies wobble between these extremes, as Taylor claims, individuals certainly do. They are merely the consequences of A, having the heaviest imprint on the oral, matrix, biosurvival circuit, or B, having the heaviest imprint on the anal, patris, territorial circuit. Now, this is a pretty antiquated idea, especially by this point in the timeline, but we can see there's probably a little bit of truth to it. If you just look out in the world or the Internet, not to take all the lulls out of it, but it does sound a little bit like red pill versus blue pill. It certainly is that way. If you go on Reddit, if you uh, if you go look up red pill on Reddit, it's going to be all that Patra stuff that we just talked earlier. And, and also just consider the yes meme that seems to be a self-aware Patrist meme. That's like, yeah, this is the stuff that we are about being in the faces of lobsters because that's how you show your dominance. Or maybe that's just what you and your crustacean wife are into. It's really none of my business. In pre-ethological terms, the emotional territorial circuit is what we usually call ego. Ego is simply the mammalian recognition of one's status in the pack. It is a role, as sociologists say, a single brain circuit which mistakes itself for the whole self the entire brain apparatus. The egotist behaves as a two-year-old in the common parlance because ego is the imprint of the toddling and toilet training stage. Bob does a similar breakdown of a body type the way he did with the previous chapter, but those who have taken their heaviest imprint on the second or anal territorial circuit in this case. These people are referred to as musculotonic or people who hold all of their attention and energy in the muscular attack defense systems and grow up medium weight, heavy enough to be hard to knock down and light enough to be quick and sinewy. It is speculated these individuals are often pushed toward or attracted to positions in the military or business where they can kick ass and get shit done. So thus far, we have these two circuits that we've discussed, the oral bio survival circuit and the anal emotional territorial circuit. Now, the cross section of these two circuits creates a fourfold dichotomy within the personality that is reflected in esotericism and mystic philosophy. Some tend to advance while others retreat. Some will tend to dominate while others submit. If you mix and match the combos, you get some interesting results and archetypes. So imagine on one pole you have advance and retreat and on the other you have submit and dominate. And like then you have like the four quarters. So we'll go over those. The four quarters. The four quarters. <laughs> The first one is the tyrant in his area of hostile strength. He sees the world as threatening, but wishes to dominate. So he wants to retreat, but dominate. Then you have the good parent in his area of friendly strength, advances eagerly into the world, confident in their decision. So this person advances and dominates. These two archetypes occupy the dominance pole, varying in their advance or retreat pole. The next two occupy the submissive pole. 
the dependent neurotic in his area of friendly weakness is eager to advance, but is unsure about their judgment and requires permission. The paranoid in their area of hostile weakness sees the world as dangerous and cannot be depended upon to make their own decisions. So stay inside and wait for us to tell you what to do, bitch. Bob then does something really clever here and relates this to medieval psychology that are what we call the humors. So friendly strength is the sanguinary humor, the lion archetype in the element of fire. The noble cat is said to represent good strength and fire represents the power. Hostile strength is the billowous humor and is identified with the eagle, a swooping symbol of imperials throughout history, and is associated with air for its high and mighty qualities. One need only look at the sword suit in the tarot to get an understanding of this energy. Hostile weakness is the choleric humor. It is identified with the bull archetype for its easily agitated paranoia and earth for its sluggish stupidness. See male tyrants in the age of Taurus. Friendly weakness is phlegmatic humor and is associated with the angel and water for those too sensitive to fight and who just want to go with the flow. Water is typically seen as receptive, but also life-giving. And if you've listened to the show before, you might recognize these symbols used in this exact context symbolically in films like The Shining. And we talk about that to some exhaustion. So if you're into that kind of thing, go check out The Shining episode and go check out our Doctor Sleep episode. That's probably our most popular one. But anyway, moving on. Nietzsche's concept of resentment is mentioned in association with hostile weakness and friendly weakness, suggesting a hidden revenge motive within even altruistic philosophies, an element of hidden hostility exemplified by Jesus, mild and meek, but ready to damn enemies to burn for eternity, the passive aggressive, or even the flower child ready to be turned into a robotized Mansonite killer. Women may be familiar with the nice guy archetype and their similar concealed danger, one might also mention the quote-unquote incel. Bob points out that Kabbalists find these symbols in the Old Testament as the four Kerubic beasts who appear in Ezekiel and the world card of the tarot, which shows a being who has balanced all of these forces within themselves. It is not uncommon to associate this symbol with the fixed signs of the zodiac, Taurus, Leo, Scorpio, and Aquarius. These four quadrants can be conceptualized as automatic or hard imprints upon the personality and elements that bind us to our ego. As such, the alchemical work is accomplished by binding or reprogramming these automated imprints consciously toward our higher aspirations. Here is revealed the imagery of the chariot, or A27, which shows the driver, blah, blah, the driver of a vehicle drawn by four sphinxes. In the end of this chapter, one is informed that since we all have territorial, emotional, circuitry, we may best exercise it by playing with children, especially in large groups, where one may need to arbitrate a mammalian territorial dispute. It's my Barbie! Swimming or jogging is suggested to keep the muscles from feeling like they're being starved. What? So I actually have to do exercise to get this circuit working properly? What the f <laughs> Stupid. Uh, psyching somebody out activates old mammal centers in the thalamus where body language communicates emotional signals. Okay, so you can just psych people out. You don't actually have to do exercise. Whew. Okay. Advanced work in this circuit involves some hazards in personal relationships. Oh, what if you don't have any personal relationships? Like bullying somebody if you've never been able to do that before. Or learning to submit and be docile if you've never been able to do that before. Hmm. I've just noticed that it seems like a lot of people in the bedroom are usually doing like the opposite of whatever it is they do in person or something like that. I don't know. I guess if you listen to what Jack Parsons has to say, those people are actually doing what they're supposed to be doing by integrating more of themselves into themselves, especially their opposite through sexual alchemy. So I guess if you're a wussy boy, 
in person, but a raging, mad, crazy, tyrant, sex Casanova beast in the bedroom, you're doing a half decent job of integrating your whole personality, I guess. I mean, there's dudes who will pay to have their balls stepped on. Ladies, just get out there. If you have dreams of stepping on balls, you can just do that and get paid. I don't know what the safety procedures are these days to prevent contracting any sort of uh, bio material. But I think stepping on balls is fairly safe. You know, just... I don't know. There's probably some paperwork involved. Just a theory. I don't know. So to wrap up the free show, I think what we need to do is go back and look at the exercises that Prometheus Rising gives you to work on to strengthen up these first two circuits. And this is why I can always suggest this book as a beginner for occult studies, because they're pretty they're pretty interesting exercises. So let's begin. First circuit oral bio survival circuit one determine to enjoy this primitive circuit fully from now on play with yourself and others and the environment shamelessly like a newborn baby meditate on unless ye become as a little child ye shall no wise enter the kingdom of heaven whoa that was robert anton wilson saying you that not the whole rabbit but hey knock yourself out too Never mind your diet. You'll reach the optimum weight for your height when your brain is operating properly. Enjoy one really sweet, gooey dessert every week. Diabetics are cautioned to not do this. Three, get high on marijuana. If this is not permissible to your super ego, just find some ginseng and then go to a health spa. Enjoy a good swim, massage, and a sauna. Repeat every week forever. Four, Take a course in Kung Fu or Karate for at least three months and then recheck out all this material. Five, lie on your back and pant rapidly to the count of 20. Each exhale inhale count counts as one, not two. Panting means breathing rapidly through your mouth, which is forbidden by almost all experts in health, but it's only an exercise, not a full-time practice. When you reach 20, stop, resume nose breathing in the slow, rhythmic manner recommended by yogis to the count of 20. Then repeat the panting to the count of 20. Then repeat the proper yogic breathing. This is known as the breath of fire in tantric yoga. The results are most amusing and enlightening. Try it. Six, visit an aquarium and observe very closely. Try to see the bio survival circuit of the fish brain in operation and recognize how and when that circuit in your own brain has operated throughout your entire life. Seven, if you don't have a baby or haven't had one in a while, find somebody else's baby to play with for an hour. Then reread the chapter. I wholeheartedly suggest not doing all these things at the same time, though. Moving on to the second circuit. This is the anal emotional territorial circuit, in case you have been listening to this whole episode and forgot. Anyway, one, whenever you meet a young male or female, ask yourself consciously, if I came to hand to hand combat, could I beat him or her? Then try to determine how much of your behavior is actually based on unconsciously asking and answering this question via preverbal body language. That one's kind of deep. I'm happy that's the first one. Two, get roaring drunk, pound the table, tell everybody in a loud voice what a dumb asshole they are. Three, get a book on meditation. Practice for 15-minute sessions every day or month. Then go see somebody else who always manages to upset you and make you defensive. See if they can still press your territorial retreat buttons. The fourth exercise is spent trying to figure out which quadrant your friends belong to. Five, go see a lion house at the zoo. Study the lions until you feel you really understand the reality tunnel. Six, rent a video of some kind of comedy that small children like. Street, that this is where his, like, like, okay, Boomer, the Three Stooges, Abbott and Costello, observe carefully and think about what function this humor serves, but don't neglect to laugh at it yourself. Seven, spend all day Sunday looking at animal shows on TV, getting stoned on weed if this is permissible to you, then go back to the office the next day and observe the primate pack hierarchy carefully, like a scientist. Which, if you're not, why are you even going to work? 
what are you what are you even doing there? Why do I have to pay five dollars to hear the rest of this episode? It's one of life's mysteries, much like the Third Circuit, which I'm going to be talking about. But to hear that part of the show, head on over to www.patreon.com slash the whole rabbit, where five bucks will get you all our extended episodes bonus stickers and access to our discord where you can chit chat with all of the weirdos that like this show including myself and maybe even play minecraft with us when we eventually boot it up we just have been busy working on the show and memes so um if that sounds fun to you eat carrots and shoot lasers